Good afternoon and welcome to the joint uh, AI Group, ACOS, EEC and Property Council webinar on enabling the energy performance revolution, focusing on the very sexy topic of energy governance and market reform. Uh, I'm very glad that you've all been able to join us today. At the outset, uh, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, waters and community, and pay our respects to cultures, country and elders past and present. Uh, I'm Tennant Reid of AI Group, and I'll be monitoring, uh, moderating today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panellists today, Alex St. John of EEC, Kelly Court of the Australian Council of Social Service, and Frankie Muscovich of the Property Council of Australia, all, all popping into visibility like clockwork. It's incredible. We have a jam-packed hour of discussion in front of us. Uh, we'll shortly turn to why the demand side matters uh, and uh, which if you're on the line, you probably have a strong suspicion as to why it matters. Uh, a bit of focus on what we're trying to achieve with this somewhat unusual stakeholder initiated uh, policy consultation. Uh, and then a focus on the various barriers that the demand side and demand side issues face in influencing the uh, the operation, the rules, and the planning uh, around our energy systems, and we'll we'll finish up with some discussion of the next steps uh, and what you can do and what we can do uh, to take these results forward and plug them into policy processes that are underway. So, uh, as you would be aware. There are already some major uh, consultation processes underway and policy development processes underway, including the National Energy Performance Strategy, but also uh, changes to the governance, to the, the uh, objectives of the national energy markets. What our intention is with our, this process is to cover a, um, a gap in the range of processes that's currently underway, which is strengthening and, and ensuring the efficacy of uh, the demand side perspective in all of that. Uh, there is, uh, of course, a, a high demand side orientation to the National Energy Performance Strategy, but uh, it uh, has a lot of topics to cover. And so far, the governance of energy policy and energy markets is not directly within scope. So we've seen an opportunity to extend the discussion to an area where uh, there, there could well be some scope for uh, some very positive change. So with that, let's get into each of these subsectors and I'll call on Alex to introduce why the demand side. Thanks, Tenant. Um, so very quickly, I guess uh, it's important that we understand what we're talking about. From the point of view of the four organisations on the call, uh, we're talking about the demand side being things like energy efficiency, energy management, uh, demand response, um, anything basically that an energy user can do to change either the volume or the time of how they use energy, uh, and that's in a variety of settings. Uh, some things we're sort of not talking about as much are things like solar panels um, are, are great and fantastic, um, but they've achieved a pretty broad market penetration already. Um, and so we're looking to uh, explore some of the, the other parts of the demand side and the things that consumers and businesses um, can get involved in. So why is the demand side important? Um, very broadly, it's one of the quickest and easiest ways for us to reduce emissions. Uh, and to drive down energy costs. We think that, or ARENA says that globally, energy efficiency and electrification will drive around 45% of global emissions reduction to 2050. Um, that's quite a lot. Uh, we have some numbers in, that in Australia as well, and it's relatively similar. Those are both measures which occur on the demand side of the energy system, so on the, on the customer side of the meter. Um, 
we uh, we're very obviously you know we're really people who are very interested in this sort of stuff. Um, but there are other really important arguments: energy efficiency and energy management and demand side um, activities represent some of the lowest cost um, emissions reductions that are available. Most of them are either negative or fairly low cost, um, and they can be implemented you know very quickly uh, without really large um, infrastructure investments on behalf of, of communities or, or government. They can be done by businesses of all sizes, households, um, even and individuals as well. Um, why would we be most interested in it? Well, at its best, the demand side can make an energy transition cheaper and faster and hopefully more equitable. Um, if you think about uh, how we might uh, go about um, changing our renewable energy, uh, our energy generation and so forth. We're going to be relying very heavily on solar and wind and those sorts of things. Um, as we go through, we change our um, energy generation infrastructure from high emissions to low emissions. We're going to have to build a lot of things. If you simply replace what we've got now uh, with a low emissions infrastructure, then, you know, with solar or whatever, if you think about that through the course of the year, we're probably going to have to build quite a bit of storage if we just go and replace like for like. If, however, we were to look at the demand side, look at how we're using energy, um, there's an opportunity for us to reduce, for example, the, the cost, the amount of storage that we'd have to use. So that's reducing the total cost of the transition. Um, you know, the demand side is, is you know, interventions on the demand side have been around for a while. Um, just a, a, as a reminder, things like, energy efficiency standards on refrigerators um, have, you know, in 2017, they saved Australia 360 megawatts of power. So that means that we didn't have to build uh, a middling uh, gas-fired uh, generation station to, to meet that demand. Um, the National Australian Building Energy Rating System and Commercial Building Disclosure have reduced the amount of energy intensity in our commercial buildings by around 43% in a decade. So this stuff works. Um, it's re it's uh, uh, cost effective, um, it helps us get uh, lower those emissions, and there's also a bunch of other benefits as well, health, productivity and competitiveness, which uh, I think my, my colleagues will very happily talk to you about in a moment. Well, indeed. Uh, Kelly and Frankie, um, what would you add to the, the scope of what Alex has introduced? Well, I'm, I'm happy to kick us off. I think um, from where I sit and, you know, very much taking a, a built environment and property sector lens to some of this, I think the interactions between different economic sectors are, you know, sort of really coming to the fore when we're, you know, I, I think it's now no longer useful to think about the transition of the energy system in isolation from the transformations that are happening in the built environment, but also the transport sector. So when I talk to my members about, you know, their, I guess their, their vision for where the built environment is going is that that line, that sort of traditional line, if you like, at the boundary um, of their property uh, when they connect to, um, you know, uh, the, either the electricity or, or the gas sort of uh, network infrastructure, that line's being blurred, um, you know, from here on out. Now, buildings uh, are positioning themselves as, you know, potentially the batteries of the future. So there are there are lots of things that can be done, um, you know, behind the meter, so to speak, uh, that are going to, you know, decrease the need for new uh, network uh, investment infrastructure, uh, but also potentially take load off the grid at key times of the day um, to moderate peaks, which we know is very important from a, you know, from an investment um, perspective in terms of what needs to be built out for the network. And when we look at, um, you know, how these decisions are, are being managed, um, I, I think it's fair to say until until now, um, you know, the, the building sector or the, you know, the things that happen behind the meter haven't really had a strong look in um, to the, you know, to those sort of planning processes around what does the, you know, the future network, um, you know, infrastructure look like, uh, taking into account all the innovation that we know is coming down the pipeline with EVs getting plugged into buildings and the potential for not just uh, them to draw energy from from buildings, but to be a source of, you know, of power at key times. So looking at all these um, different, uh, you know, technologies, if you like, 
energy efficiency being bread and butter uh, pursuits of, uh, of many building owners, as well as some of these, you know, uh, more exciting prospects around demand response at key areas, looking at moderating that consumption uh, and demand profile through smarter use of controls. All of that, um, you know, once you sort of zoom out on how that might be done on an individual building scale, potentially has a really enormous impact, um, you know, across the network. And we want to make sure that, um, you know, that, that the owners of buildings and that the, the governance and policy processes put in place take fair consideration um, of that and they're factored into to all of this planning because I think it's now no longer useful for us to think about buildings, transport, energy as separate sectors. Um, they're going to be increasingly connected. Thanks, Frankie. Kelly. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Frankie. Um, I, and I just sorry, I just wanted to also recognise that I'm on Turbal and Yagara lands and pay my respects to Elders Past, Present and Emerging. Um, absolutely agree with what Frankie said. I think, you know, our energy system's already becoming more decentralised. It only makes sense to incorporate greater demand side participation into the energy system and extend the system to um, end user premises, whether it be manufacturing plants, hairdressers, or someone's home. Um, and as Alex pointed out, you know, the we've already had this focus on efficient electric appliances, and that's resulted in significant reduction in energy demand, avoided infrastructure build, but it's also had direct cost savings to consumers, and we can absolutely build on that. So, you know, a focus on energy performance of buildings and operations through the utilisation of more efficient and electric appliances, thermal efficiency and demand management, as Frankie mentioned, can, you know, result in significant ongoing reductions in, in energy bills. And at the household level, you know, we see significant, where people spend a significant amount of their time and in increasingly so coming out of COVID, there's the benefits can be huge. So we, we've seen modeling, but real world experience of the the savings, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars that we get from energy performance um, improvements that are permanent year on year um, as a result of, of energy performance. And this is really important because it helps us avoid spikes in energy stress during periods of uh, price hikes brought on by international factors, which we've seen recently, um, bumps in the energy transition, and also extreme weather events, which we're going to see more of, which you know will in, will have an impact on on the price of energy. Um, so you know, having that permanent reduction in affordability of bills is going to be really important, um, especially for the people that ACOS represent. It's an opportunity for us to significantly reduce energy hardship, you know, alleviate energy debt, disconnection, and really contribute to reducing poverty and inequality. Um, we also heard Alex mention health benefits. Um, absolutely energy performance can have co-benefits there as well we've got too many people live in homes that are too hot in summer too cold in winter currently more people die from heat related deaths than any other extreme weather event in australia which you know in a country like australia is just phenomenal um, and we saw a little study done by the victorian healthy homes program they found that um, small energy efficiency improvements to houses yielded health system savings around 10 times higher than the associated energy bill savings and that participate, participants reported improved health and well-being. Um, so we, we see multiple benefits to consumers um, and people that flow from this demand side focus and, and really it should serve to elevate demand side measures as the first fuel um, Thanks, Tenham. Thanks, Kelly. Anyone would think that you've spent a lot of time thinking about this and working on it very hard. <laughs> Just All right. <laughs> well, so uh, let's then focus on uh, what we're trying to achieve in, in the space and with this process. Um, back to you, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Tenham. Look, I, I think we can um, talk about this hopefully fairly 
fairly quickly. Um, from the point of view of the organisations on the call, we see a really important window of opportunity in which we can hopefully influence not only the, the National Energy Performance Strategy, as Tenant was mentioning before, but also the, uh, the course and direction of uh, energy policy amongst federal and state and territory governments. We're really hoping as a, a, as a result of this process to try and help uh, to, to bring some awareness to some of the issues we're going to talk about in this webinar, uh, but also to hopefully bring, bring as many people on board for the ride uh, as we can. So we're really, really interested uh, in getting everybody's um, views uh, ideas on how we can better utilise the demand side in our energy system. Um, and we're hoping to bring everybody along to, I guess, put together a set of cracking recommendations um, to put to governments far and wide on, on how they can unleash the energy performance revolution. And I should say, we're also trying in the process to uh, make the best use possible of stakeholders' time because we are stakeholders too and uh, conscious that there's a lot going on. So the, the purpose of uh, today is to maybe not uh, obviate the need to read the paper. It's a cracker of a paper, but to give you a preview that will get you through it uh, much faster and to, to pose some of the questions, get the start of some feedback, but basically to accelerate the process for you of uh, getting information to us and through us to uh, the uh, all the relevant governments across Australia and the governance agencies. Um, Kelly or Frankie, is there anything we've missed before we get to the barriers? I mean, I think we'll get to this at the end, but I think we should also say, because as Tennant said, we are all stakeholders as well, and we struggle with the volume of consultation that's happening at the moment. Um, I think we're really happy to take people's feedback and comments, however they'd like to provide that to us. And um, I know that we certainly find that uh, you know, sort of small group discussions, round tables where it's not necessarily asking you to go write a detailed letter um, with your with your written comments, but but dial in for a half hour or forty five minute chat and give us your thoughts. Uh, you know, in that way, we're very open to here. Uh, we just think the topic is too important uh, not to give it its uh, you know its its sort of due focus as a part of this. Um, you know, broader consultation around where we might take reform. All right. Well, let's move to the, uh, the, the, the difficult part of this. So uh, why isn't this already uh, the number one concern for uh, energy uh, market bodies for energy ministers. Why is the demand side still in some ways an afterthought? Alex, take us into the first set of problems. Thanks, Tenet. Um, so I suppose one of the, the really important things to frame what we're about to talk about is we're all really interested, not in necessarily the particular rules in the energy market or this, that, or the, the, the details. We're really interested in thinking about how are the decision um, the decisions in the energy market made? What are the what are the processes by which we come to decide what we're going to do? Now, in at the moment, uh, we have a process by which we have a uh, a set of ministers, every state and territory, and the federal minister um, make agreement on energy policy. That that agreement is codified in what we call the Australian Energy Market Agreement. That energy market agreement is then translated into our national energy laws. Uh, energy, which are uh, electricity laws, gas laws, and energy retail laws. Um, they are then interpreted by the Australian Energy Market uh, Commission to uh, create our national electricity, gas, and retail rules, which set how our markets work. Uh, and this is particularly so for the, the states covered by the national um, national energy, electricity market. Uh, those laws are then, uh, sorry, those rules are then implemented nationally by people like uh, AMO and the Australian Energy Market uh, regulator, um, and then there's some. There can be some interplay with state and territory governments making separate rules, which which add on to those. Those rules all then um, influence 
what uh, market participants, so investors and businesses in the market do. Uh, and at the very end of all of that, we get down to the impact of all of those decisions on consumers uh, and people who actually use energy. So uh, the question I suppose that we're interested in is in the 21st century, is this uh, an appropriate, is this the right framework for how we make decisions? Um, I'll, I'll rip off uh, one of Frankie's um, favourite terms here and say that uh, is this a, a 20th century way of dealing with a 21st century uh, problem? Um, if we move to the next slide, we can think about, well, what are the, uh, what are the founding precepts on which we judge the system? Uh, and we have the three objectives of, of energy, which are set in the, uh, in the energy market agreement and the energy laws. And they, they say that um, the objective of how we, we, we regulate, I suppose, um, energy is, is to promote efficient investment and efficient operation and use of uh, energy services for the long-term interests of consumers uh, with respect to price, safety, quality, reliability, um, and the reliability, safety, and security of the national energy system. Now, that all sounds great, um, but those are uh, objectives which are very strongly focused on the supply of energy. They don't actually put consumers or users uh, at the heart of that. Um, we, we talk about efficient investment in the system. We don't really talk about um, lowering the cost of the system, for example. There's no um, consideration in this of, um, for example, equity between different groups of consumers. So are these the, the right objectives to guide the development of our energy system? Are they the ones that will uh, encourage a holistic view, I suppose, between um, the energy demand and energy supply, which we increasingly know, are, you know are just as important to each other in the energy system? Um, there, I mean, there are a couple of particular issues that we've been interested in and uh, mentioned in the discussion paper. So, for example, uh, we talk about price in the energy objectives. Price is how you recover the cost of the energy system. But could we say something about maybe it's an objective to minimise the total cost so that, you know, that we have to recover fewer costs from, from people, driving down the, the total cost. Um, and I think if we sort of uh, we move on, we can also see, um, the, you know, the, these energy objectives in the system are um, uh, implemented in a few ways. So we've got the um, uh, we've got these energy objectives, and they guide how we make rules in the energy system. Um, those rules are made by the Australian Energy Market Commission, who are a fantastically um, expert and uh, and engaged group of people. Um, they uh, make rules and, and those rules are meant to be accessible and everybody who participates in the market is meant to be able to say, well, I, I'd like to produce um, uh, a set of, you know, an improvement on those rules or things like that. Um, we also have things like regulatory investment tests, which I'm sure a tenant will be able to uh, <laughs> talk about to a certain extent. And these are tests which are meant to uh, look at the rules and figure out, well, we're proposing to make a new investment in the network. Does it, uh, is it an efficient investment? Does it serve the long-term interests of consumers? Um, now, in those uh, tests, there's usually a step which says, well, have you examined any alternative to, uh, you know, making this investment, which customers will end up paying for? Um, and there is that, that step. But, you know, if you're, uh, if you're doing uh, a, um, a proposal for your network investment, you probably don't have a big commercial incentive to identify non-network options. And there isn't really anybody else around who's also able to, um, you know, say, well, hang on, you know, you want to put that big transmission tower there and that's going to cost a lot of money. If we use a bit of demand response, maybe we can obviate that. There isn't really anybody in the system in the moment who's, um, who's able or, or tasked with doing that. And another question is, you know, we have, um, we have quite a lot of people in the system who are expert. Um, they're really knowledgeable. But does it necessarily represent the variety of consumers in the system? Do we do we have the people in the room, in the frameworks, making those decisions who are a representative of all energy users? Or, you know, is there a bit of a bias towards the supply side? These are some of the, the questions that we're looking in the paper. Um, and what are some frameworks that maybe could, you know, change, change the focus of some of those decisions, change the focus of what we think about? I might stop there, I think, Tenant. I think that's a start on these barriers. 
Thanks, Alex. Uh, so I'll throw first to to Kelly. Uh, what do the barriers look like to you? Thanks. Thanks, Tennant. I, I was going to talk a little bit about the NEO, my favourite, the National Energy Objective and laws, my favourite topic for anyone that's done any work with me. Um, and look, just building on what Alex was saying, um, you know, those those laws were developed what, back in 2004. The energy market has changed significantly in those 20 odd years. Um, we're more decentralized. Um, you know, people now generate energy, for example. Um, and our national laws and objectives just really are no longer fit for purpose. But they're really important because they really guide how our market bodies, the Energy Market Commission, the Australian Energy Market Operator and the Australian Energy Regulator, um, undertake their respective powers and functions in the operation and regulation of the energy system. So you know, it's critical that we actually get our laws and objectives right and fit for purpose for this new system. Um, as Alex was saying, the NEO emphasis is on price rather than cost or like we some ACOS likes to talk about it sometimes, affordability of energy. So, you know, for example, the size of the energy bill. And, you know, while these terms might seem synonymous to some people, what's the difference between price and cost, there's a significant difference. Price is only one component that contributes to the size of the energy bill. How much is consumed is also a major factor. And we know that energy performance can significantly impact on how much energy is consumed and therefore the overall size and cost of an energy bill. So, you know, for us, the inclusion and prioritisation of demand side objectives like energy efficiency, fuel switching, load shifting, and behaviour change, would really change how energy market bodies and participants prioritise investment and operation, but it also incorporate linkages to energy performance of buildings and other things that Frankie talked about earlier around transport um, and other sectors as well. Um, the, the NEO also makes no mention of equity between consumers and the AMC's guidance on implementation of the NEO, for example, does not make particular mention of consumers with different levels of information, resources or agency in the market. And we're already seeing energy inequality increase and that people being left behind. Um, so, you know, as the energy transition progresses, it's particularly important that regulatory decisions, market structures and behaviours ensure that social and distributional impacts of energy policy and regulatory decisions are considered, that it doesn't place significant cost burdens on, the, on those with the lease um, able to bear them, and that we also don't continue to increase energy inequality. Uh, and then NEO also doesn't actually articulate the consumer outcomes that we desire. It talks about the long-term interest of consumers, but it doesn't define what does that actually mean. And did we actually ask consumers what are the outcomes they want from the energy system? Um, so, you know, nowhere does it articulate what are the consumer outcomes and nor is there a requirement for consumer views to be taken into account in developing policy and regulatory decisions. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that more later when we talk about the consumer voice. So, you know, our view is that we can lower energy bills, improve reliability and create better outcomes for consumers, particularly, again, for people experiencing financial and social disadvantage if we have a greater focus on demand side solutions, social equity and consumer outcomes in our national laws and objectives. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, Frankie. Thanks, Tennant. I just want to support everything Kelly said and maybe as a throwback to that um, questionable image of a bunch of white men sitting around making decisions on behalf of all of us. Um, offer a perspective around just how inaccessible, um, you know, these rulemaking processes can be for anyone sitting on the demand side of the equation. So, um, and, and, you know, may, maybe we might uh, reflect on some collective and joined up experience um, at this in recent years where, 
uh, you know, organisations like ours would have um, supported shifts to, to say, get up that um, uh, wholesale demand response scheme, uh, you know, to, to appropriately value uh, what demand response could deliver uh, into the market at a point, uh, you know, to, to avoid having to put on more generation uh, rather, th rather than remove consumption from the grid. Um, even for organisations like ours that employ people focused on policy, you know, am I an energy market wonk? Uh, maybe some people would say that, but but to me the, that process is almost impenetrable in terms of the way, um, you know, that a consumer advocate uh, would seek to navigate it. And so that should tell us that something is fundamentally wrong <laughs> with the way that these um processes are managed so when you think about uh not just the you know the overarching um imperative uh you know as kelly talked about to make sure that um you know the, the governance of our energy markets is really working in the best interests um, of consumers that it's also set up to effectively take account of their views and allow for participation um you know of of the the organizations that represent them and, and i think it's probably fair to say that um those current processes are probably fundamentally not fit for purpose at the moment um so that tells us we need to reform the way that we go about changing the rules as well thanks frankie and uh while we've been speaking a question's come through from michael uh, which is relevant very much to this segment, how can or will or should the national energy law be modified to take account of the gas network when it switches to be a declining, not expanding network in Victoria from next year, uh, which goes I mean, potentially to a few issues, but one of them is uh, whether it makes sense to continue to have completely distinct uh, objectives and and structures around electricity and gas, uh, rather than to recognise that uh, these are, are, are two interrelated systems that uh, contribute to the supply of services that people and businesses need, uh, and that the the shift uh, of some of those services from being delivered by the gas network to being delivered by the electricity network needs to be managed very carefully in in law as well as in practice. Um, any other thoughts on, on that question? Um, Tennant, it goes back to um, engaging with the consumer and what's important to the consumer. I mean, for consumers having to pay for two network costs seems quite ridiculous, um, especially for people on low income that are really struggling to pay their energy bill. Um, you know, we know and there's increasingly more evidence that gas is unhealthy in the home, um, um, impacts on asthma rates um, and, and other respiratory illnesses as well. And, you know, I think if, uh, so I think if we engage consumers more, then, um, you know, we would, and and have that requirement in our laws and objectives, I think we would be considering what consumers want as opposed to necessarily what an energy stake, an energy production company may want in terms of the future of the energy system. So, you know, again, it, it goes back to making sure we're consumer focused um, in how we manage and, and transition our energy system. And, and I would just yeah support that and also seek to emphasize that you know mo moving forward um it probably doesn't make sense that these um you know assets are managed you know entirely separately in some respects um and that we don't what we don't want to be getting ourselves into is a situation where you're pitting different um different and then and then also the same consumers against each other. Um, through this process where you have a, you know, a, um, in the case of the, the gas distribution network, a declining customer base, uh, which does, um, I think, present enormous challenges from an equity perspective, uh, because it, you know, it may very well be that early adopters of electrification and, and getting off of gas 
uh, you know, a, a perhaps not going to be low income and vulnerable consumers that can least afford uh, to do the upgrade. So I think considering um, the future of those networks, um, uh, those assets together makes a lot of sense. And we've certainly, I think in the course of um, pulling this paper together, but also look at looking at other um, policy work happening around the world, that's increasingly the case in other jurisdictions where they're seeking to um, move forward with a more holistic framework of the management of the energy sector. Right. Well, let's, uh, having not yet solved one set of barriers, let's move on to confront another set uh, around governance. Alex, take it away. So, um. There are a bunch of ways that we can participate in energy markets, um, but for we think for consumers and small businesses, they're relatively limited. Uh, if you think about how, you know, as a consumer, how do you participate in the market? So there, there are mechanisms. There's things like virtual power plants where you could sell off a portion of your battery if you had one. Uh, you could ex export some solar generation, which, of course, is very popular amongst everybody. Um, you could do some, uh, participate in a state or territory energy efficiency scheme if you're lucky enough to live in a jurisdiction where they've got one. Uh, you could uh, engage in energy management to try and sort of do a bit of your own gaming of the system to optimise your energy costs. You could participate in the wholesale demand response mechanism. So there's a few, but in the energy system, we, we feel that consumers have um, a relatively small amount of agency uh, that being able to participate in the system is, is not easy, that consumers are largely price takers. Um, you know, and, and to a certain extent, there could be a bit of a Vogon feel about it. Um, is it is it easy to participate in the wholesale demand response mechanism? Well, given there's sort of only one or two participants, probably not. Um, you know, do we have processes that really support people to, to be uh, in those, you know, the, to innovate and be in those... Um, uh, mechanisms, um, you know, not 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 to a great extent. Um, so there is, I think, a a, a pretty uh, strong argument that we might need to get a little bit better at how we uh, design mechanisms for people to participate in it. Um, again, there's a pretty strong um, idea here of the consumer, and if we sort of move uh, move on and think about who is the the energy consumer and how are they represented, which is something that Kelly is uh, is very very strong on. We, we've had a notion in policy land for some time of a, a relatively idealised energy consumer, um, you know, a uh, someone who's really engaged with the energy system, um, who, well, to be honest, even looks at their energy bills. Um, and it, it's, it's turned out over the past few years that uh, maybe consumers aren't quite as engaged as all that. If you think about it now, the Victorian government currently has a scheme where they'll pay you $250 just to compare your electricity bill. Not even not even save money, but just to compare it, you'll be given $250. And it sort of suggests that maybe consumers don't have the same level of engagement or information or agency as perhaps some of our market reforms have, have suggested they might be. Um, and the other question is, you know, uh, are consumers really deeply embedded uh, and are they adequately um, embedded in how we make decisions? Um, you know, the, when I was writing the paper for this, we looked around and we saw that I think I, I'd figured out one of the 17 directors of our energy market bodies um, had a biography that really uh, put forward that they had a, bit, a bunch of customer experiencing consumer issues. Most of them were sort of lawyers and uh, business executives and energy uh, company leaders, and, and, and that's all incredibly useful experience. But is there a, a role for the consumer to be embedded more deeply uh, into those those decision making processes? I think there's something um, something to be said um, with that. I think there's perhaps one last issue that we would also quite like to talk about, um, and that's sort of on on the next slide, which is. But if we, if we think about the energy system and you think about the supply side, we, we know to a, large, you know, to, a, to a large extent who is in the supply side. It's energy generators, it's distributors of energy, uh, network service businesses, it's retailers. That's a bunch of people. They're relatively well-defined. 
if you had a room big enough, you could put them all in, in one room. And that's, and that's great. And so from an energy uh, policy point of view, it's relatively easy to make policy regarding the energy supply side of the system. Now, that's half of the energy system, but the other half is the people who use energy. And that is literally everybody else. So that's buildings, it's energy, it's transport, it's hospitals, it's education. It's everything that's not in the energy supply side system. And that's really hard to deal with from a government's point of view. How do you start um, making linkages between parts of the energy system so that you can make sensible policy? Uh, how do you link between transport? Um, how you know a, a change to the National Construction Code will change the energy supplies that we're going to need? So what are the mechanisms by which we can build connective tissue in the energy system and energy policy to better connect demand and supply. And so that's about consumers, it's about users of energy, but it's also about some of the um, structures that we have in place in the energy system and, and whether they're kind of fit for purpose, whether there's enough representation of the demand side in those energy systems. These are some of the questions that we're, we're thinking about right now, and we really appreciate some ideas on those um, as well. But I think that's enough for me on this bit, uh, Tennant. Thanks, Alex. And uh, I'll, I'll um, bring back uh, Frankie and Kelly, but I'll, I'll just observe that one area where the the challenges of the, the current framework dealing with the demand side really reveal themselves, I think, is in the integrated system plan process, which you know, is a tremendously important process. Uh, it continues to evolve. Uh, it is uh, one of the the most useful tools that uh, we've been refining in recent years still though it is a very uh not just supply side but even uh, within the supply side very transmission oriented like transmission is its bread and butter and uh the demand side is a, a matter for uh for assumptions uh and, and assumptions that can bounce around more in response to interpretations of public policy than uh in response to feedback from users themselves uh it's a clearly a process that has got more refinement in front of it if it's incorporating uh, the um, gas planning process as well in future I think that'll extra double underline the importance of a, a more sophisticated and more action-oriented uh, approach to um, integrating the, the demand side. But with that, Frankie, then Kelly, and we've got a hand raised from Cecilia in the audience, which I will attempt to uh, throw to uh, once we've had initial comments from first Frankie, then Kelly. Thanks, Tennant. Um, I think here uh, there's a real opportunity, I think, to break down some of the silos um, that exist in terms of the policy coordination piece. Um, Tennant, you spoke about the ISP and whilst, um, you know, everything you said is true, uh, it, it, you know, the central scenario envisions, as Kelly said, an enormous role uh, for distributed resources of, uh, you know, of not just uh, energy generation in terms of rooftop solar, but but increasingly um, how we might moderate, uh, you know, demand at scale across, you know, the households of Australia. And yet uh, there's not there's not policy in place to drive a lot of um, what those expected outcomes on a, on a 2050 horizon look like. So when we look across other jurisdictions as well, um, in terms of the way that they're dealing with this. Um, one of the, you know, I think one of our favourite examples to look at, at least in the building sector, is uh, the example of California, where you have their um, Energy Commission, which combines uh, policy making for building standards and, you know, the, the electricity networks in the one place. They're not done by separate entities. Uh, it's the same. So they're not working at cross purposes. And the very structure of the organisation doing the policy work uh, acknowledges as, and is encumbered uh, with the responsibility of planning for the future of, you know, of the way that both of those sectors 
um, you know, are seeking to, to manage their uh, energy demand and consumption into the future. So, you know, whilst maybe we wouldn't um, necessarily suggest a, as radical a shift um, as that, um, that like there is a very strong case uh, to, to make sure that we're not having, you know, the, the planning for the future of the, the electricity and gas networks uh, happening off to one side uh, with no input from, say, other parts uh, of government that are responsible for the development of building standards, which have flow on effects. Um, and, you know, this goes two ways um, for the use of the energy system, that those things should be considered together. And whilst there's, um, you know, there's obviously uh, really great work um, being done in government to try and increase that uh, connective tissue. There's only so much you can do when you sit in separate departments uh, working to different time frames and different uh, policy consultation processes, um, you know, that, that you're responsible for running. It's just not possible to do it uh, in as coordinated a way if you're not trying to connect up these processes and give responsibility um, to someone to manage that. Thanks, Frankie. Kelly. Sorry, I was multitasking, answering questions in the chat <laughs> at the same time. Um, so yeah, so I was just go I was just going to talk a little bit about the consumer voice and so as I as I mentioned earlier there is you know in our national laws and energy objectives that there is no definition of what consumer outcomes is or you no know, clear articulation of that or a requirement for consumer engagement and consultation in developing policy and, and regulatory decisions um, and you know as Alex said that um, looking at our market bodies is only one person that has identified expertise involving consumer issues. Um, I hope we're talking about the same one there, Alex. I think it's the the AER who um, who that board member actually recently moved on and they specifically replaced that person with another person with consumer expertise. Um, so that was good to see, but, you know, one in one in 17. Um, you know, the balance of energy market bodies are corporate leaders, former energy industry executives, business executives, public servants, lawyers, and, and even the staff in these organisations are predominantly economists, engineers, and technical experts with fewer expertise and demand side behaviour and consumer um, areas. Now, I mean, that's not to diminish um, the valuable expertise of the leaders and staff. Obviously, those skills are important, but there is a clear gap in, you know, systemically driving the activities of these bodies towards the involving interest of consumers. Um, and who are likely to benefit the most from expanding demand side measures in the energy market. Um, and, I, and I guess the other thing is, you know, while these bodies do have mechanisms to consult with energy stakeholders, and I'm going to use the word energy stakeholders here and not consumers, um, to inform their decision maker, making, um, the voices representing consumers, especially the small consumers or communities or people, and demand side measures are really limited in number and poorly resourced compared to energy companies and the voices representing supply side of the energy market. I, I mean, I find myself in too many forums where I'm one of three consumer voices compared to, you know, 20 or 30 energy market, um, energy companies and other energy market participants um it, it's really hard to then have our views weighted in such a way that you know is prioritized and informs decisions sometimes the weight of of other voices um, can really influence decisions that are made by market bodies and it's even rarer still for these bodies to engage directly with consumers um, and, you know, while, while ACOS can represent a specific consumer, we don't represent every person um, experiencing financial and social disadvantage. And, you know, it's really important that we hear from people directly about 
what's important to them as this as the energy market transitions. So, you know, I go back to, you know, the whole purpose of this, this governance paper is about what objectives and structures and resources do we need to put in place to firmly put consumers and people at the centre of the energy system and the energy transition? I mean, that's what we should be focusing on um, is, is people. Thanks. So uh, that's that's a good place to uh, come to the, the, the final segment. Now, um, Cecilia had her hand up uh, per... Um, uh, feedback from uh, from IT. I'm not sure if we can um, unmute people. So if you, if you've got further questions or comments, uh, do put them in the Q and A um, or, or the chat. We are able to see uh, chat messages from a number of people. Um, but let's consider the the where next in our final ten minutes, and we will get everybody out of here in time. Uh, there is uh, we've we've posed quite a number of questions in the discussion paper. Um, if you've already read the paper and you're super keen, you are free to give us some feedback uh, by by text now. Um, but if you if you haven't, that's fine. That's that's what this uh, webinar is to support. Um, providing uh, more considered feedback later. There are some excellent questions that have been posed in the Q&A. Uh, and so I think we will get to um, all of those if we can. But uh, an additional point that I'd like to raise is if people would like to participate in this process, uh, provide us more feedback uh, through uh, potentially uh, involvement in some um, some focus roundtables or, or follow up discussions, uh, do let us know uh, in the chat um, or, or through the Q and A. Um, we will be very keen. Uh, you can email Alex, who has helpfully put his email address uh, on the screen. Uh, and ultimately, we will be making recommendations uh, to government on not just that these issues are important, but on specific ways of responding to that. So uh, Siobhan has asked, you know, what are the major regulatory changes we'd like to see to better incentivize demand side investment? Uh, that's where we want to get to. But before we, uh, we are definitive on that, um, Alex or Kelly or Frankie, do you want to jump in with your your favourite regulatory change to achieve these objectives? One each, lightning round, starting with Frankie. Thanks. Um, I think um, we are all proponents or sort of bandy about um, the term first fuel uh, in the sense of energy efficiency. I, I think... Um, what I'd most like to see in the way that um, decision making is done when it comes to, you know, the case for building out network uh, infrastructure in a given area is before there's a call made on a supply side solution that's going to require more investment um, in building out networks that we all have to pay for, uh, consideration of alternatives on the demand side that would negate um, you know, the uh, the necessity for that investment. So um, at the same time, considering, you know, for, for that, you know, that given scenario, what are the demand side interventions that could be brought to bear and that it's considered very early on in the process, not as an afterthought uh, after a decision's been made however many years ago uh, to build out the network in a certain area. So that's my... um. You know, if I waved a magic wand, it'd be that point of the process um, consideration of in demand side measures um, that that should be preferenced uh, ahead of um, new new investment uh, in the build out of networks um, to manage cost to consumers. Kelly, number one regulatory change. Oh my god! Um, you must choose. Let's just choose what. Oh, uh, you know, clearly I want to change the uh, the neo, but that's probably not a, 
a regulatory change. Um, and look, and I think some of the things that I want to talk about are not so much regulation within the the current and the way we currently define the energy system. It, it's about, you know, expanding, as I said earlier, what we consider the system, including the premise, the home. And this is where regulation becomes really important around things like mandatory rental standards so that, you know, all homes or rental homes improve the energy performance, um, you know, zero emissions, um, best practice, new builds and things like that. These, these are all important regulations that are going to have an impact on a lot of people, especially people on low income who will live in those homes that we're, that we're talking about. And Alex? I think I'm just going to, I think I'm just going to make this the, my standard sort of uh, four or five word slogan here, which is make this somebody's job. Um, we've got such a, you know, a, a huge amount of people who have some great expertise and, um, some really fantastic ideas at the moment. Uh, you know, while we've had some great leadership from the federal government, we we don't have a mechanism by which people can be uh, accountable or or can coordinate those sorts of things. So um, I've got ideas on, you know, how you might do that. Other people have got uh, different ideas. I think one thing I'm really keen to hear from everybody is um, if you could wave a magic wand, how would we make this somebody's job and what would be the, uh, the most effective way of doing that? Very good. Now we are almost at time. Frankie, was there one more of the questions that you wanted to uh, give an answer to? Yeah, there was one um, directed to me off the back of um, a previous comments around, you know, is there any reason we wouldn't advocate, uh, you know, a more extreme yeah. solution like um, like a California Energy Commission style body. Um, I, th I think we're all here uh, genuinely interested to test, um, you know, support for, you know, for different models. So I think um, one, whatever we do in Australia needs to be fit for purpose for the challenges that we face and the kinds of policy silos we're looking to, to combine uh, to do this really effectively. Um, so that would be my first point. And, and I think second point is we're very, you know, open to wanting to hear what, what the level of support would be for, uh, as Alex has just put, making it someone's job, um, right? So exactly what that would look like. Um, I, I wouldn't be shying away from bold solutions here at all. Uh, California's is, is one model, uh, but there are other models to look at as well and just emphasise that we need to make sure we're dealing with, you know, the issues that are that are most salient um, in an Australian context. Yeah. And I would just add to that that um, I think there's a widespread sense that the status quo is, is not fully functional. Um, at the same time, uh, there is there is always going to be a certain amount of caution about setting up a completely new thing. And so uh, the, the the productive pathway is probably around adapting what we've got and um, combining and refining um, as much as it is wholly introducing wholly new elements. Um, we, we've uh, what we don't want is uh, to to get to something that um, just can't command consensus um, and 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 doesn't happen. Now, with that said, we are just on three o'clock. Uh, we've had a number of uh, people signal and organisations signal their interest in getting involved in the chat and the Q&A. Thanks to all of you. Thank you to everybody else who, who participated and maybe you're going to be beavering away on a, on a short written submission. Uh, maybe not. If you can get us feedback in any other way, we, we're very keen to have it and to represent it in what we finally collectively take forward. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Kelly Court and Frankie Muscovich and uh, Alex and John and the greater EEC machine that have put this together uh, and made it possible. And thanks to all of you for taking some time out of a very busy period to participate and give us some feedback. We look forward to getting more.